All right. Hello, everyone. Again, I'm saying this for the benefit of the online people. Welcome to the week seven lesson. It's not really week seven, but the week seven lesson part two. Before we get into that, though, of course, we'll go over the homework. And if I remember correctly, we did one through four and what was it? Nine, nine through 14. All right. That should be pretty straightforward. Well, kind of sort of relatively straightforward. All right. Number one, list the 13 primary Koine prepositions and their basic definitions. And I've got them on paper, too. Yay. Oh, yeah. I've done that yet. Yeah. So where did you, you guys go for that one? Your chart. You gave us your diagram chart. Yeah, I was really nice on that one. Thank it you. was basically a copy it down, yeah, try to have fun. Although That's okay. I managed to get one wrong, but I figured it out after. Uh, that, that works. Yeah. So yeah, you got yeah from the chart. You just pull those and the basic definitions I gave you in the chart. That's all I was intending. If you decided to look it up and look up more stuff, that's fine too. But all I meant was from pulling from the chart. As long as you have at least that material on there, we're good to go. Okay. Any questions about that one? No. Okay. So then we're good. All right, so question number two. What is demonstrated by the following two sentences? He put the knife on the table versus he put the knife in the table. Location. Has relative locations? No. No? No. It's not? Nope. No. It's not location? Oh, my nope. goodness. That's what your examples are. I know. Nope. Okay, so. Is it the same thing to say that you put the knife on the table versus in the table? No. Okay. It is not the same thing. I know, that's why location is important. Because your example was the man sat on the chair, the chair passed under the table. Mm -hmm. That's what, not what this was about. Okay, so what was this it about? was about the fact that prepositions are not context dependent like other words are. You can put a many, many, many different prepositions in there and it still be a, a, tr a sentence that's going to make sense okay. and could possibly be true depending on what the original author intended. Okay, so where do you find that? I thought I would um, add something about context. Where did, you, where did you? Let me see if I can bring it up here. Let's see. You. Oh, not just context. Yeah, so an F. Even though a given preposition may fit in a given grammatical construction, it does not mean it accurately reflects the original author's intent. Based on context. Okay, so just refer to F for that. Well, the idea was spotting that the sentence can be exactly the same but have a different preposition and it will change the meaning. The context does not determine the meaning. Context is not Yeah, context more specifically does not determine which preposition is appropriate. Okay, say that one again. Context. The context by itself will not determine which preposition is appropriate. Okay, and evidently in the future I need to make that one a little bit more clear. Maybe I need to give a hint. This one was item F. Okay, so context by itself will not determine which preposition is appropriate. And that's another one of those things, yeah. You think it's clear to you, and then the students look at us like, we have no idea what you're going yeah, for. Yeah, I've been there. <laughs> Glad it made sense to you, Mr. Johnson. <laughs> Get it to us. See, and I said, like, oh, I didn't make it complicated. I didn't either. That's why it's wrong. <laughs> you know, I should have stuck with my complication. <laughs> yeah, that was not what I was trying to get at. What you guys said may have been true, but that was not what I was trying to get at. So what were you trying to get at? I was trying to get at the fact that the context alone is not enough to tell you which preposition is correct. You can put different prepositions in there and still have something that'll work. You could put pretty much any preposition in there that you wanted to and you could still have a complete sentence. Yeah, because that's the only thing that was different between the two sentences was just the preposition, but it makes all the difference in the world. And that's kind of what I was thinking is like, you know, it's not, it doesn't mean the same thing in and on. It, there's, there's 
they're different. <laughs> it's all different, yeah. So yes. So, yeah. Okay. All right. So it's good that I think that one wasn't on the test because that was a question I probably would have had to throw out. Mm -hmm. See, that's why you give them long assignments to start off with, and you go over them, and that way you know which questions you don't want to put on the test. <laughs> you all are guinea pigs. All right, number three. Which cases can be used to determine the meaning of a preposition? The genitive. That is one of them. And the dative and the accusative. Yep. Yeah, genitive, dative, accusative. That is correct. So by default, what does that mean? Which two are not going to determine the meaning of a preposition? Accusative. No, the accusative no, is one of them. Oh, that one. That, one, that is one of them. So it's the nominative and the vocative. Yes. Yes. Yep. So genitive, dative, accusative, those will determine the meaning of a preposition. Nominative and vocative, they just are what they are. Okay. And that is a fairly important thing to know in translation is if you have a preposition in front of a word that has a case, that case isn't there to tell you how the word functions in the sentence anymore. It's there to tell you how to interpret the preposition. Okay. And that's hard for people to get used to because they usually think of when they say they come across a genitive. What word do you usually want to put with genitives? Not. Not, not. Not, not. Not, not. Not, not. What's a genitive? A genitive. Yes. It, Against. It's something that shows possession or derivation. Okay, so you're saying what we normally... What helping word do we usually throw in with genitives? Of or from. Of or from, correct. Okay. If you put a preposition in front of it, though, you don't worry about the of or from anymore because it's just there to tell you what to do with the preposition. It doesn't have a meaning on its own anymore. Like an example. Give an example of that. <sighs> Well, let's see if I can pull it up from the lesson here. Because we did go over this. Special functions of the cases. Is that what we're uh, That's not what we're talking about okay. here. But that's the section. All right. So in our last lesson, uh, week seven there, in section two, mm -hmm. and we'll go down to E. So section two E. The preposition was epi each time, right? Yes. But the word that came after it was different cases. We had a dative, we had a genitive, we had an accusative, right? Uh -huh. Those datives, genitives, and accusatives are there to tell you how to interpret the preposition. They don't have a meaning on their own anymore. Because okay. normally with the genitive, the one there in the, mini in the middle for the various things, mm -hmm. normally with the genitive we would say of various things or from various things. But you leave that part off, and instead you let that tell you how to interpret epi, the preposition. Okay. So in those cases, if you have a preposition right in front of it, all of that information goes to the preposition. You leave off all the normal helping words. We don't worry about the of or from anymore. And in the case of the dative, we don't worry about the two or four anymore. It goes with the preposition. That's what those are there for. They don't do what datives and genitives and accusatives normally do. Instead, it's just there to tell you how to interpret the preposition. Okay. It's like with all languages. These are the rules until they're not. Until they're not. <laughs> yes. yeah. So, okay. So, normally the cases <laughs> will have helping words you put with them and those kinds of things. But if there's a preposition in front, that part doesn't matter anymore. It's there to tell you what to do with the preposition. Throw it away. Well, it's not throw it away. It's take it to the preposition. Uh -huh. All right. So that's question three. Question four. Write a sentence in English. I made this nice. I should have said in Greek, but that would have taken way too long. Write a sentence in English in which a preposition is used in a non-concrete way. You know, as soon as you said that, my brain literally went blank. <laughs> So I went down the list of prepositions up here and okay. just picked one. I picked para. Okay. So beside. It said she is beside herself with grief. 
That is a good example of a non-concrete, because we don't not literally mean that she is actually beside herself. Yes. It'd be rather difficult. And so I cheated and used one of yours, but changed it a little bit. Right. <laughs> so I mean, seriously, my brain went blank. So I said it was an underhanded deal. Underhanded. Uh huh. Ah. Mm, instead of an under the table deal. Yeah, it was underhanded. I use the same preposition, but different adjoining words. Yes, <laughs> that's what I said. Because it can be underhanded. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this is true. You're not wrong. <laughs> Seriously, I probably could think of this all day long until you said that. Now <laughs> Until you say to do it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that's okay. I had many students in math class that were like that. Daily, you could ask some question to their face. What's this? And they'd sit there and they'd tell you. But put the test in front of them. Go. Everything goes blank. I have no idea what I'm doing anymore, Mr. Johnson. It's the same thing we've doing, been doing for weeks. I don't remember. Okay, come over here and sit next to my desk, and I'm just going to ask you a few questions, okay? Okay. <laughs> then we get done with the questions, and I have them write it down. I say, okay, now go put this on the test. <laughs> I usually have them write it. I'm too lazy for that. All right, so 9 through 14 was the other part that we had on there, and it was, yeah, I won't say easy, but hopefully it wasn't terribly difficult either. In the middle-ish. It actually wasn't too bad. Let's say. There was the two that it doesn't describe in your two books. In the main books, yeah. Other. It was in the other material. But it was process of elimination because you know what theos is. Which also da, da, da. lesson four is in two both of the examples. Yeah. 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 I know I do weird things that way. <laughs> Alright, so the first word was theos. And what did we find out for our definition for theos? Great. Great is a good definition for theos. Um, that's not the typical one. What's the typical one? God. 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 Yep. Great is probably the more accurate one, but if you put that down, no one's going to know what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. And then number 10, the chaos. What did we find out for that one? Letter B, righteous. That is correct. Letter B, righteous. Yeah, the chaos. The chaos. D-E-K-A-E-O-S. The chaos. What are we asking about? I was writing down what the English letters were under it so I could try to get a word. Ah. Uh, and I think I have the chaos. Chi. The chaos. Because you have a um, diphthong there. there. Oh, see. I didn't catch those that day. I did. Not that I get them great, but I did. <laughs> well, you have flashcards. You keep going back over yours. I do. That does help a little bit. All right, so we found that the chaos was righteous. I made that one way too easy. You just go across the line, and it's right there. Oh, I didn't hey. do that. Oh, yeah, I guess it is. Yeah. Yep. Well, I actually did it. I did an alphabetical order. You just said, this is going to be the easiest way to look it up. I gotcha. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right, and then a day. What do we get for that one? Already F. Yep, F already. That is correct. So a day is already perfect. Number twelve, a chaos. That. Correct. It is one of the demonstratives, and it is the far demonstrative. So instead of this, it's that. A chaos. And this one we actually have seen before. I didn't really actually intend to put it on the last one, but it wound up there. On. Untranslatable. Yep. That is exactly right. It is untranslatable. <laughs> and then last but not least, ha. Or oh, no, that which is. Yep, that a, that which is. It is not a personal pronoun. It is the deterministic relative pronoun. I know. Mounts and I have disagreements. Okay. more helpful to think of it as a determiner in my opinion, but Mounts and I will go rounds on that one. Does he even know you? Um, 
I know that Wallace knows me. I don't think Mouse does. Okay. Yeah. Hi. I've had more conversations with Wallace. I don't think I've had any to date with Mounts. Okay. <laughs> John. Oh, never mind. We'll talk about that later. Randomness. Okay. <laughs> the person that you met in Culver's. Oh, yeah. There's that, too. <laughs> that was cool. <laughs> All right. So that is the homework assignment from last time, at least the problems that we were able to do. Any questions about them? Nope. Um, do you guys understand where I was I was trying to go with number two now? Uh, yeah, but no. Yeah, but no. Changed. You could put more than just in and on in there. Yeah, you could put any number of prepositions in there. And I did, I had to, I had to comment down something about context, and I just skipped over it. Yeah. yeah. Prepositions are one of those things that cannot be determined by context, at least not context alone. So we have to have the original author's preposition there. And we also have to know the case as well, and that's what the next part of the lesson was about. Okay. But yeah, that's the main point. Okay. Because yeah, I was I was keeping it very simple. So. Yeah. And that's another one of those things that bugs me about people is you know they pull out the strongest concordance or whatever it happens to be. There's lots of good resources out there, but people sometimes misuse them. They'll do a word study on something, and you know they'll they'll pull out the the concordance and there's this preposition there and they'll look up you know 27 different things that the preposition can be and they'll go through and based on what they think they'll pick whatever definition they think happens to fit well with prepositions anything fits that's the problem so you, have to go you actually have to know what you're talking about when it comes to prepositions a little deeper to figure out Mm -hmm. Yeah, when you do word studies, if you're just getting into the language, it's a lot safer to stay with the nouns because mm -hmm. verbs are relatively difficult. And then prepositions and a lot of the auxiliary words are very difficult. So stick with the nouns to start off with. You're not going to go too far wrong. And then start ratching out from there. But a lot of people, they just go to whatever happens to interest them that day, and I can understand why. Mm -hmm. But then they wind up teaching other people, and it sometimes perpetuates some bad things. Be very careful when it comes to prepositions. Context will not tell you. It is not definitive. All right, and let's go ahead and get back into the lesson. And you guys will be happy I forgot about doing the quiz. So hey, no quiz this time. There you go. Yeah, so there is the old quiz. We won't revisit that. We've already seen that. And let's see here. Prepositions and locations, that's what we talked about last time. Prepositions is all about locations. Gave some examples, could sit on the chair, passed under the bridge, went to the store, relative locations, then we introduced all of the Greek ones. Well, not all of them, there's technically a few more, but all the major ones. And we had lots of stuff, which if you do it on your own, is easier if you separate it out. Yep. Each one gets its own flashcard and its own little diagram. Yep. And then what we just talked about here a few seconds ago, just because it fits doesn't mean it was the original author's intent. So you have to be very careful with prepositions. You have to, you have to know what it was. And we did a coin example. We pulled a, a verse uh, out of scripture and said, if we just had to take a random guess, how would we fill it in? And we actually didn't do too bad. I was kind of there to walk us through it, but we actually didn't do too, too, too bad. Ek, we kind of got with a little bit of help. Uh, the dia, nobody got that one. Because that one's just weird. Because that's 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 idiomatic language. There's no way that you're naturally going to get that unless you actually know what's going on. But you guys did get the pros, and that was completely basically on your own. I didn't really help you with that one. So one out of three solid, kind of two out of three with help, and the third one is just no, no. Right. Prepositions and cases. We did go over that, and we said that. You know, when they're used in concrete ways, it's pretty easy to interpret them as long as you actually know what the preposition is. If you don't, it's really hard to guess based on context because it could be anything. But if you know what it is and it's being used in a concrete way, eh, it's pretty straightforward. But the problem is what happens when you have non-concrete cases. The physical image and what's actually going on isn't necessarily going to match. I used the example of an under table deal and something that was above board. You guys came up with examples of your own of things that were not being used in concrete ways, more or less idiomatic language, figurative. And we said that when that kind of stuff happens in Greek, what we're going to look for is the case of the word that's right after the preposition. And that will help further define it for us. 
So I gave you guys the example of the Greek word epi. And it will fall, sorry, it will be in front of three different cases. So there's three different cases that will follow it that will help determine what its meaning is. Either it will be followed by a genitive, a dative, or an accusative. And there was a particular verse in scripture that happened to use all three of them. So I just said, hey, that's a good example. It has all of them. Let's just do that. So we looked at the first one. It had dative. And since it was dative, it's going to be on the basis of or at. On the basis of makes most sense in that context, although it's still a little weird. Basically means utilizing planks. Yes. And then the genitive. Genitive was a little bit more physical, a little bit more concrete. So on, that was just fine. And then for the accusative, on to against, what made the most sense there was the two. So three different meanings, same exact preposition every time, but followed by different cases, giving you slightly different nuances on how it actually should be translated. And we also looked at some of the translations and said, you know, they don't always diversify it as much as they technically should. But usually, the vast majority of the time, they still manage to get the basic meaning across. You know, it's not like it's going to wind up, you know, with completely different doctrine and theology or something, you know. The Savior's not suddenly going to turn into Satan or something like that. You know, it might be technically off, but it's usually close enough. All right, and then we decided, well, as long as we're playing around with this, we might as well figure out how we do the parsing codes. And we discovered that that was actually relatively easy. You look at the case of the word that's after it, and you put it after the P. So we have apa, and that is a preposition. The next word is tase. And what is its case? Genitive. Genitive. So when I do the parsing for apa, what is it going to be? It's a preposition genitive, right? Yep, preposition genitive, so p dot g. And you do the same thing on down the line. You basically just pull the case forward from the word that's after it, and you've got your parsing done. And that's all that mounts does in the interlinear. That's exactly what it is, which is relatively straightforward. All right, so that catches us up with where we are now. And we're going to talk about some important passages. And some of them are a little controversial, some of them not. Some of them just irked me. This first one is one that just irks me. Because this one is just one that I deal with Mormons a lot, and so this is a topic that comes up. And there are certain translations you never want to use when you're dealing with a cultic group, especially paraphrastic translations because they will walk all over that in really weird ways. So for our first example, we'll look at Colossians 4.16. In the NLT, it says, after you have read this letter, referring to the letter of Colossians, pass it on to the church at Laodicea so they can read it too. And you should read the letter I wrote to them. And that preposition to is translating the Greek word ek, and its parsing code is p.g. So it's a preposition followed by a genitive. So that's how the NLT does it. The NIV, on the other hand, which is it's not a, truly a paraphrastic eh, translation, uh, but it is fairly dynamic. It's, it's meant to be much more readable, much more comprehensive, uh, comprehensible. So it's not always going to be as formal and it's going to not always follow along just so. But it does wind up using uh, a different preposition here. So it says, after this letter has been read to you, see that it is also read in the church of the Laodiceans, and that you in turn read the letter from Laodicea. And it's still ek that's being translated there, and it's still a preposition uh, with the genitive. So our question is going to be, which one's right? Because those technically are not saying the same thing. No. So let's first try to establish what's at. What is it that's at stake here in these two translations? Who wrote that or who the letter is to? Not quite. That would be really close, though. Why wouldn't it be? Well, one is saying you read this letter, you give the letter after you read it to them, and they have a letter and you read theirs. So let's switch letters. Right? That's what you know. Well, both of them are basically saying that you you switch letters with them. Both of them basically say that. But the main issue between them, though, because I'm imagining myself as a, a Mormon, and I'm walking up to this, and I pick up the NLT, and it says, well, Paul wrote a letter to the Laodiceans. 
the book of the Laodiceans is not in your Bible, therefore your Bible is incomplete, it's missing things, that's why you need a modern day prophet. But that's what the text says. It says that there's a letter to the Laodiceans and you don't have it. Your book is incomplete. If you read the verses before, you know that Paul is the author. Paul wrote the letter. Yeah, but you still don't have the book of Laodiceans in your Bible. But it's not talking about the letter of Laodiceans. It's not talking about the letter of the, the church. Uh, the it says, the letter I wrote to them. Yeah. So it should be to the Laodiceans. Yeah. We have to the Ephesians. We have to the Corinthians. Where's the to the Laodiceans? It says that the letter exists right there. At least in the NLT it does. We need more information. Well, in the NLT it says that they had it there. It's more than enough information. Apparently not. Well, how is it that it reads in the NIV? The NIV makes it sound like the letter is from the Laodiceans. Or at least that it's coming from them. Yeah. It doesn't ever say that Paul actually wrote to them, though. It just says that there's going to be a letter coming from them. Okay. okay. So I, as a Mormon, could I use the NIV if I wanted to say that Paul specifically wrote to the Laodiceans? No, no, you couldn't. I couldn't. But I could with the NLT. So what is at stake is whether or not Paul wrote a letter to the Laodiceans specifically. And if I'm playing the Mormon, I'm going to say, well, if he wrote one to them specifically and you don't have it, your book's incomplete, guys. You need a modern prophet to tell you what all the missing information is. I've never heard that argument before. Yeah. It actually comes up frequently. <laughs> it actually does come up fairly frequently. <laughs> that's good. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, that's what's at stake in the, okay. in the above translations. And that's why this one particularly irks me is because I get to deal with it with certain people. Yes. Okay, so the from is the more correct, though. Is that what you're saying? Well, that's what we're going to have to figure out. There are some times where actually I do like the NLT over some other translations. There's times where it's actually more accurate. Hmm? I like it better on this one. Now, the question is, which one is going to be right? So what we're going to have to do now is we're going to actually have to look up Eck, and we'll go ahead and we'll use the compact guide. And we're going to have to see what it means when it's compared, combined with the genitive, because that's the case that we're given in this one. So it's p.g, so it's with the genitive. What does ek mean when it is with the genitive? Now, ek is actually kind of easy because it only occurs with one case. It's only ever in the genitive. Okay, ek, genitive. From or out of. From or out of. Yep. So we'll go ahead and put that in there. It means from or out of. Where are we putting it? Oh. Where they from or out of each? Oh. Right there. Okay. Yep. okay, so as per the compact guide, does ek ever mean to? No. No. So which of the two translations is correct in this particular case? Well, it has to be the NIV. It is the NIV. It actually is from. So does the text of the Bible ever say that Paul actually wrote a letter specifically to the Laodiceans? No. No. No, well, and no other text as well, but here it definitely does not. There is a letter that was coming from the Laodiceans, but he never wrote to the Laodiceans. So the next question that follows after that one is why is there a letter coming from Laodicea if he never wrote to Laodicea? Mm -hmm. um, what was it your dad said in his sermon when we were going through the seven, the seven, uh, the seven churches? So, okay, so what was the question? The question was, well, if Paul never wrote a letter to the Laodiceans, because that's not what the text says, the, Paul, the text doesn't say that, yeah. where did this letter from the Laodiceans come from? Was so, he just sharing all the letters with them? There apparently was some letter wrote by somebody for some reason, and it circulated. 
that's the main point, is that it circulated. Okay. As with all of the New Testament authors, for the most part, their letters wound up becoming circular letters. They originally went to so-and-so, or they originally wound up at this other place, but in between, they would share them, which is what people do with the Bible nowadays. Mm-hmm. You know, if you want, if somebody is a, a Christian and they've just walked in and they say, hey, what's that thing? Do you need to take that? No. Okay. It's telemarketers. Okay. I didn't know if it was the red guy. No. So. No, they use my actual number. Yeah. So, um, what was I saying? Words. Um, it was a circular letter. It would have been some kind of circular letter. Okay. So. Yeah. As, and so. like I said, this is the case that we have nowadays. You know, somebody walked in and they said, you know, I believe in Christ. And they came from, you know, some other country, Timbuktu, whatever, and all that they had at the time was the Gospel of John, and you introduce them to, say, the, the Epistle of Romans, they're going to say, hey, can I borrow that? They're going to want to borrow it, and they're probably going to want to take it back home to share with all their friends too, right? It's the same idea. People would share these around. And a lot of times, if the original author was still alive, he would usually keep track of who had what. And that would be the case with Paul. So he knew that there was a letter that was going through Laodicea at the time that he wanted to get to the Colossians. It doesn't mean he ever wrote to the Laodiceans specifically, but he knew that a letter was passing through at the time. A letter from him or just a letter? Well, it could have been a general letter. We don't necessarily know on that one, but it probably would have been Paul, one of Paul's other letters. Okay. So, and if he was the one who was keeping track knew, of it, yeah. that would imply that he was the author. Yes. And it was going through Laodicea. Mm-hmm. But he never wrote to Laodicea specifically. There you go. Okay. okay, so fun stuff. So to or from? And we found out it was from. All right, so any questions about that one? Colossians 4.16. We'll do the next one. Next one will be Matthew 16, 18. And the first translation we'll have is the HCSB. And it's actually being phased out now. They're going to the Christian Standard Bible instead. I know, I know. We just get it and then they change it on us. It's, yeah. But yeah, they're changing that one. And actually, in a lot of ways, I think that it's a good thing because the HCSB was had some peculiarities in it wasn't necessarily anti-doctrinal or anything like that, but there are some things that they did in it that was just weird. What does that stand for? HCSB, Holman Christian Standard Bible. Oh. Yep. Holman Christian Standard Bible. And now they're just going to the Christian Standard Bible. They're taking the Holman out. and Holman. Rep- They just don't like Holman anymore, huh? Well, they also thought that it was a little too many letters oh. for that. Oh, condense it. Yeah. Condense it. yeah. HCSB doesn't exactly roll off the tongue either, so. No, it doesn't. But it was good. I like it. Yeah, it's decent, but there, it had some weirdnesses, and this is actually one of them that has a little bit of a weirdness. Okay. So in Matthew 16, 18, Jesus is speaking, and he says, And I also say to you that you are Peter and on, translating the preposition epi with the dative, this rock, uh, rock, I will build my church, and the forces of Hades will not overpower it. And the part that I was saying that was a little be- weird is the forces. Does anyone know how that's usually translated? Yeah, usually it's translated as gates. Okay. The HCSB took a little bit of a liberty there and said forces. It actually should be gates if you want to be accurate to what the word actually means. Yeah, that is something that they did actually correct in the CSB though, so I was happy about that. They were a little bit weird. And then, this one is a little bit longer translation. This is a, a direct translation, a fully representative translation, and that's why it's longer. Everything in the Greek text gets represented, so it tends to make things long. And it says, And I further express to you that you are Peter, and in addition to this, which is rock, and the in addition to is translating epi this time with the dative, in addition to this, which is rock, I will embolden my assembly, and the gates of the place of the dead will not come down forcefully on top of it. Wow. I don't like that. <laughs> well, it definitely is wordier. I will give you that one. 
it's yeah, just because it's wordy, it's not what we're used to. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, so we need to look up. So here we first need to figure out what is it at stake. And we're focusing on the preposition. I mentioned that the forces was weird, but okay. the main question is what it, is at stake with the prepositions? So on versus in addition to. Well, on kind of represents kind of location, placement, if you will, on top of. Yeah. And where in addition to is it's being added. We need to deal with our Catholic friends more often is what I'm hearing. Probably. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is a major, major conflict in church history between Protestants and Catholics. Mm. It's which way you translate this. Yes. Catholics actually prefer the way that the HCSB says it. Okay. They love okay. the way that the HCSB okay. says it. Because yes. they say that the Roman Catholic Church can trace its lineage all the way back to Peter. And Jesus said that it was on Peter that, this, uh, that the church would be built. And so where, where the throne of Peter is, is the true church. And even as the HCSB says, the forces of Hades will not overpower it. So if you say that the church has, you know, become defunct in church history, you're going against the very words of Jesus. Yeah, if you say the church has fallen into error, eh, it's a problem. Church has fallen into error. <laughs> but this translation says that the forces of Hades will not overpower it. Not be overpowered as, as to destruction. Does it mean it's not having an influence on it? Uh, so it depends on what you mean, but the blanket translation would definitely support a very Catholic rendering. Okay. How, how do you know that the epi there is a demonstrative? Just because not, it doesn't say demonstrative. I mean, um, dative. Sorry. Dative, yeah. because of the words that come after. You look at that in the Greek. The words that come after are going to be in the dative. Okay, there we go. Yep. It's always determined by the word that comes after. It will be determined already. Okay, there we go. Yep. Right. Yeah, it's not the preposition itself that's dative. It's the word that comes after that's dative. So it's a preposition with the dative. Okay. It's so not a dative preposition. There's no such thing. It's a preposition that is followed by the dative. Now, the other translation that's given there, there is pretty much no way that a Catholic could possibly use that to support their doctrine. No, when you look at it up in the data. Is that what you're saying? Well, uh, that's not what I'm saying. I'm oh. just saying the translations by themselves say very different things. Oh, yes. One says the church is going to be built on Peter the Rock, and the forces of Hades will not overpower it. The other one says that in addition to Peter, the, uh, the assembly will be emboldened, and it says that the gates of the place of the dead will not come down forcibly on top of it which is a promise about eternal life. It has nothing to do with whether or not the church will continue to unsullied in history. That's how I, yeah, look at it too. So what would you say is at stake in the above translations? Foundation of the church. Basically, yeah. Whether or not the church is built on Peter. Do we look for where Peter is to figure out where the, the church is? the words um, in addition to as part of our, our definition. Yeah, what does it give for a definition for epi in the compact guide? In the compact oh. guide? Mm -hmm. It says, um, it has the genitive and the dative says on the basis of at on No, that's accusative. Oh no, that's right, accusative, there we go. So yeah, yeah. on the basis of and or, or at. at. Yes. So just given that alone, which translation seems to be the correct one? Um, on the basis of, I mean, the, um, in addition to. In addition to is the same thing as on, a ba no, on the basis no, no, of? No, it's not. Well, what this is saying is say none of them, neither of them are. Well, if you had to pick one that was closer. Would you say on this rock is better, or in addition to this rock is better for what epi means with the dative? Well, in a 
basic sense, then you'd say on. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah, there's a reason why in church history it was usually interpreted as on, and most translations today translate it as on. Okay. No, I don't. So the question becomes, should we all convert to Roman Catholicism now? No. They're looking at on in a different way. Well, we and just said that but, the basic but, definition seems to be the closest there. Well, but on, but how they're how they're expressing on though, because we're like saying on the basis of. Well, on the basis of Peter, yeah. I will build my church. Okay. That's pretty much the same thing. Okay, I see what you're saying. Okay. Let's take a look at another passage here. If you guys will, in your interlinears will go ahead and turn to Second Corinthians, and I believe it is seven thirteen. Yep, Second Corinthians seven thirteen. Okay. And I want you to find where Epi is used in Second Corinthians seven thirteen. And we'll figure out what it means there. In addition. In addition, right? Uh-huh. And what kind and what is the case that follows epi? Is it followed by the accusative? Is it followed by the genitive? Is it followed by the nominative? Well, actually, it can't be followed by the nominative because the nominative be, never works with prepositions. It looks like it's dative. And it's with the dative. Yeah. So with that other translation that we looked at, is there actually a basis for it in Scripture? Is there places where you have epi with the dative that actually renders in addition to? Yeah. Yeah, there is. Okay. 2 Corinthians 7.13 is one of those. Okay. So it doesn't show up in most of the standard works, but when you look at it in the text, there's really no other way to translate it in some places. 2 Corinthians 7.13 is one of those places. It's very hard to get around that concept of in addition to. Okay, so how do you know... To go to Second Corinthians. Well, that's the thing. You don't. Okay. We've seen places where that's basically how you have to translate it based on context. And if you had a fuller resource, okay. like the uh, lexicons that I gave you, or if you guys wanted to get really into it and get the broke down and got the B dag, the, the big one, mm -hmm. it would give that as a possible definition. But here's the thing. This is one that it really could be translated either way, because. Okay. As per the, the basic definition of the dative, it's on the basis of or at. That's the basic definitions for dative. Mm -hmm. You look into it a little bit further, and you find out that in addition to is a viable option. But those two things do not mean the same thing. Yeah. So it could be on the basis of or at. That's perfectly applicable as per the compact guide. You actually look it up in the interlinear and see some of the ways that it's being used, and it is used as in addition to, even when it's with the dative. So both of them are perfectly viable. So I already know which one's right. And this is another big, 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 big uh, point of exegesis. When it comes to determining doctrine and theology, heretics are always going to go for the things that are nebulous. Meaning? Meaning if something can be interpreted different ways, one of which is a way that suits them, they're going to go with that text. I see. So if we're going to combat this, we're going to look at this and we're going to say, well, this can be interpreted multiple ways. We have to be honest about that. Mm -hmm. It can be interpreted multiple ways. So then what we would do is we would say, are there any clear passages that would be against what Rome is teaching here? Okay. So just as a matter of exercise, what would you guys say is a clear passage that would be against Peter being the first pope, the infallible head of the church? Like the whole Bible? <laughs> <laughs> Let's try to be a little bit more specific than that. Well, Running up to your Catholic friend and handing them a Bible and say, here, read that, you'll be good, is probably not going to be a very useful conversation. Yeah, the light in the way. No man comes to the Father but by me. This is Jesus speaking. Yeah, and, that, and Peter is the conduit that he's using. No, not in that verse. It's Jesus speaking about But here in this particular verse, it says that the church is built on Peter, so Peter is the conduit through which the light of Christ comes. But not, it doesn't say not that. Not for salvation. Hmm? It doesn't, like the verse that she's using, is doesn't say Peter, though. Mm -hmm. 
It's Jesus talking about himself. Yeah. He's saying, I am. And, and this one does say Peter. Huh? And so you put the two together, and that's how you get complete doctrine. You have to look at the whole scripture now. No. You don't have to look at the whole scripture? <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> Not those two. <laughs> to make a correlation. <laughs> Okay, and you guys think of any instances where Peter was definitely not infallible? Oh, well, let me see. Deny three times. Yes. Didn't do it. Well, that was before he was reinstated by Jesus. After he's reinstated by Jesus, he's okay. Oh. Then he cut off the ear. <laughs> I was going to say. Well, that was still Jesus before. Said, that was behind before, me, too. Satan. And, and <laughs> okay, so afterwards that he did something. Oh, I know. Mm-hmm. When he was pretending... To, well, he wasn't really pretending. He, he, he full on was. He, he was a Jew, <laughs> but he was pretending that he was a Pharisee type Jew <laughs> instead of how God had said it. Well, he practice. wasn't pretending. He was he was associating himself with the circumcision party. Yes, yes. Even though he had clear, um, clear um, instruction, you know, by by God, by you know, Bible. That um, it, it's not circumcision, physical circumcision anymore. It's circumcision of the heart. He was being, um, he was compromising mm-hmm. the gospel in that, you know. And who was it that confronted him? <sighs> was it Paul? Mm-hmm. Okay. And was Paul one of the twelve apostles? Yes. No, he wasn't. Well, I mean, not the no. original, not the original. He wasn't one of the twelve apostles. Period. He wasn't. Not even later. Oh, okay. So what is he then? Uh, Paul? Uh-huh. He is one of the apostolic men. He was one of the ones that come later. Okay. Yeah. There we go. It's like, why is he one of them? Yeah, so if you can be corrected by someone who's not even in your own group, chances are you're not infallible. And yes, it happened after the resurrection and all of those things, yes. he's still definitely not infallible. So we go to the clear passages and use them as our light on the unclear ones. If you have something that can be interpreted multiple ways, and it happens, you go to something that is clear and obvious, and you use that as your guide. So here, yeah, in the text itself, it could be on, it could be in addition to. Both of those are perfectly viable. They're within the range of what that particular preposition epi means when it's used with the dative. Both of them are in the range. Both of them are possible. So we look outside of that, and we say, what is clear outside of that to help us understand which one is going to be correct? So using that as our reference, what happens with Paul correcting Peter, which one would we say is actually going to be the more accurate one? The DT. Yep, the DT. If we didn't have that broader context, though, we couldn't know. This is why the Bible has more than one book. Yes. And where do you find that passage that we were just talking about where Peter... Or Paul confronts Peter. Yes. Paul himself talks about it in Galatians, uh, particularly chapters 1 and 2. Okay. Yep, I believe he said, I confronted Peter to his face. Yeah, gotta love Paul. Yes. <laughs> tell us how you really felt. Well, sit down and let me tell you. So any questions about Matthew 16, 18 there? Just a second. The online audience is going to be so confused. We didn't have the cute quiz. We didn't have any Jeopardy music. It's just going to throw everyone off. <laughs> So any questions about that one? No. <laughs> Are you sure? I'm sure. Okay. If you guys do wind up thinking of questions, and this goes for the online folks as well, you can always message me through Facebook. Well, Messenger, technically. Yes. Get a hold of me that way and say, so when you said this, were you on crack? Or did you actually mean something? What did you mean? Words. Yep. Yeah. All right, next passage. For by grace you have been saved through faith is our first alternative. And that is the preposition dia. 
and it is being used with the genitive. The word that comes right after it is genitive. So it's dia followed by the genitive. So for by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from you, it is the gift of God. Ephesians 2.8, and we'll just call that one version 1. And then another way that some people have tried to translate it is a little bit different. For by grace you have been saved on account of faith. And still the on account of is translating the dia, preposition followed by the genitive. And this is not from you, it is the gift of God. Just dia is the only major difference here. In here, it says through would be the correct one. Okay, we will get there in a second, but okay. first we have to make sure that we know what is at stake in the above translations. Okay. What's the difference here? Okay. How you get saved? Mm, maybe. What do you mean? Well, one says you get saved through faith. One says you get saved on account of faith. What's the difference in the meaning on it? Through faith on account of faith. The difference would be basically whether faith is instrumental or faith is causative. So you can kind of imagine it like a hammer. If you have something that you want to nail down, you're probably going to use a hammer. However, you wouldn't say that the hammer was the cause of the thing being nailed. The, ha the nail doesn't go into the wood just simply because a hammer exists somewhere. There's a force. You have to be the active agent behind it. So in that case, the hammer would be the instrument and you would be the formal cause, the ultimate cause. I am the ultimate cause that caused the nail to be nailed, but I use the instrument of the hammer. The difference between these two is whether faith is an instrument through faith, or is faith the ultimate cause on account of? So we'll just go ahead and put that in there. Is faith the ultimate or merely instrumental cause of salvation? And this applies, of course, specifically to this particular verse. There's many other passages in Scripture we could look at for this topic, but for this particular verse, what is it talking about? It's the ultimate um, cause of salvation. It's ultimately, if, you're, if you don't come through faith, you're not saved. So well, and, well, it would basically be saying... Well, going back to the hammer example, is faith the hammer that God uses to get us saved, or are we the ones who accomplish our own salvation? We're the force behind the hammer. Jesus is the force behind the hammer. If he hadn't died, there'd be no cause to have faith in him. Well, and the idea is basically, where does the faith come from? Does the faith come from us, or does it come from God? Is it God using it in us? Or is it something that we come up with on our own? And there's many debates about this in church there history. Yep, yeah, there is. And we're not going to get into that. We're just going to ask, what does this particular verse talk about? Because there's many other verses, and you don't want to build a doctrine out of a single verse. I'm not saying that you should. But we're saying in this particular one... Without faith, you cannot become saved. This would be true in either system, whether it's an instrument or an ultimate cause. Yes. So we're going to have to look it up. Okay. And so... Dia with the genitive, which one is it? Is it the through? Is it instrumental? Or is it ultimate cause on account of? It says, um, or is this going to be one of those ones where we're going to have to look at something else too? I think it was like this is through. Oh, there we go. Yeah. Genitive. Okay, the genitive says through on this one. So genitive says through. Mm -hmm. Um, 167. Closer to the bottom. Yeah, 167. How many is that up? I'm looking at the letter wrong. It's got that little curly on top. It's the other, other delta. Yeah, it's the other, other one. With the so, it means... Through for the genitive. Mm -hmm. okay. yeah. so. The other one, on account of, is a viable one, but it doesn't work with the genitive there. Yes. What would it have to be for the on account of to be correct? It would have to be a, um, um, an accusative. It would have to be accusative. Yes. It is not in this particular verse, though. No. So in this particular case, for this particular verse, which of the versions is going to be right? Through. Through version one. Yep. Version one in this particular case. So when Paul was writing to the Ephesians, 
He was saying that God works faith in you. You don't work faith on God. Mm -hmm. Alright, so that is those ones. And I think that's all that we had for the passages. Yes. Yeah, yeah. All right, so we can go and we can talk about adverbs now. Yay! Adverbs, adverbs. Okay, so that one was pretty cut and dry. Yeah, that one actually did turn out to be pretty cut and dry. Okay. Now the second one, you had to go to other sources. Well, that one, yeah, there's, it turns out that both of the translations were actually viable. Mm -hmm. So we had to say, well, if this verse alone isn't going to tell us, we're going to have to look at what the rest of Scripture says. Okay. Okay. And the first one actually turned out to be pretty cut and dry as well. Okay. The NLT was just kind of taking a hike on that one. Okay. They were special. Okay. Adverbs, A. An adverb is a word that modifies or qualifies a verb, adjective, another adverb, or an entire word group. Which in and of itself doesn't mean a whole lot, so I'll have to do examples. How fast do you run? Very fast. Adverb. Yeah. So here's one example. She dances very well using to to describe the manner in which the dance is done. It's well, but not just well, it's very well. It's a further description. Or you could even say somewhat well. You could, if okay. that applied, yeah. I'm just using it. Or not very well at all. Yes, she dances very well. <laughs> Another example, they go everywhere together. They go together, okay, that's interesting. Where do they go together? Everywhere. But also, could you say, I just had it in my head. They go nowhere together. They go nowhere together. <laughs> <laughs> or how about, how about they go well together? Well That's is a, an adjective. Oh. Well is normally an adjective. Okay. There we go. However, it's being used to describe together, so language is weird. Okay. <laughs> okay. Good and well. They go good together. <laughs> <laughs> I always think of the word Alright, in English, adverbs frequently have an L-Y ending, so abruptly, quickly. Those are usually the words that we think as, uh, of as adverbs, and this is especially the case in English when they're modifying a verb. English is kind of nice that way. Greek adverbs do not work that way, though. They don't have one single nice ending. <laughs> Can't be that easy. All right, and then adverbs can be used to indicate place. So, for example, when here or inside is used as an adverb, can be used for time or frequency, like before and always. Extent, quite, almost. Intensity, completely, heartily. Or manner, briskly, randomly. Those are all the main ways that adverbs can be used to indicate place, time or frequency, extent, intensity, or manner. Taking it farther than fourth graders in the time. This is very true. Yeah, if I could just stop at the LY thing, I'd be done, but <laughs> yeah. Greek doesn't work that way. <laughs> the question of where or how. I attempted to have them answer those questions, and I just say that. Yeah. <laughs> it doesn't always work, yeah. especially depending on the group you got. Mm -hmm. All right. F. Koine adverbs are fairly rare. There are only 16 of them that show up regularly. So again, like some of the other word groups, this is one that you could go through and memorize the list, and you'd have pretty much everything down. And these ones do not greatly inflect, so they're pretty much going to look the same no matter where they are. And then I gave you a little chart of all of the common ones. 
So you have u, hos, hutos, kathos, tate, nun, palin, eke, eti, malon, exo, ede, hode, uthus, Actually, no, I got that one wrong. That's Euthus, uh, sorry. Euthus. Poo. And Uketi. Rolls right off the tongue. Yeah. Points to anyone who can figure out a song for all of those. <laughs> Lindsay, where are you? If you're listening to this, Lindsay, we miss you. We, we have no one to figure out how to make these things memori memorizable. Flashcards, lots of flashcards. All right, so those are the common adverbs. They don't show up very often, though. And I think I mentioned last time, I don't think they show up more than about 3% of the time in the text. They're pretty rare. About 3%, sis? About 3%, yeah. Yeah, not very common at all. So with that said, I will go ahead and give you guys a translation task yeah. and see what you guys come up with. That actually, in retrospect, might have been a better thing for this class. Instead of handing out pens, maybe I should have handed out pencils. It should have been when I'm not sure what I'm writing. <laughs> what is this? It should have been blue instead of black, for sure. So I can see the contrast. Yeah. Actually, weren't you the one who picked out the pens? Mm -hmm. Yep. Oh. <laughs> oh. She, she pulled out the switch Purple. that she got at. Yeah. Bright green. I should have given everyone a pen, a pencil, and a highlighter. My highlighter's on the end of my pen. You're ready to go. From U.S. Bank. That's actually kind of cool. Money. You should have given me a whole box. Well, you're a valued consumer, don't yeah. you know? Yes, we all know that your bank is the perfect one. And what you people online cannot see is the smoke filling the room again. We got back into translation and it just happens. It's the way it goes. Pretty much instantly. This is going to make a verse. Well, part of one at least. underneath. <laughs> That's the standard parsing code. That's giving us a part of speech. Yeah. Okay. So it tells you if it's a conjunction or if it's an adverb that can sometimes act as a conjunction or adverbs. Okay. Well,
So just to keep track of this, what did you guys get for the all at the front? But. But. Yeah, I mean, the first one was but. Yeah. It's neither nor. So you got but, and then the ude. And then for ude, what you get, you guys get? Neither. Neither. I'm going to help you out and say that that's probably more so not. More so not? Yeah, in this case. So how about nor then? More so not. More so not. Oh, say more so not? No, no. Huh? Just not. Oh, just not. Oh, okay. More so. I was adding all It is those. more so proper to translate it as not. There you go. There we go. It is, um, <laughs> it's not good. It's, um, noon. Yeah, ah, that's noon. Noon. Is that um, yet? Yet still? Yeah, yet still for their wonder. But not yet. Uh, what was now the eti? What's the time you are not yet all capable. It's really close. What yeah. is the eti? Oh, oh, eti is the yet. Sorry, I'm sorry. Yeah. I'm off. Is eti yet? Yeah, it'd be more properly as yet. Yeah. Yes, yeah. okay. And then what is the noon? I, I need to actually look that one. <laughs> I, was oh. like, I was giving the wrong one. Is that the one that's at this present time? Or now at this present time, at this time? Yeah, now is usually how it's thought of, but yeah, there's a few different ways you can translate it. So it's not the whole phrase, it's just now. It could be uh, that way. There's different ways to translate that one. But based on what we have so far, what's what are we thinking they're talking about here? Okay, but not yet now. You are not yet all capable. But not yet now, you are all capable. So you're not all capable. You're not all capable quite yet. <laughs> Where's the now? Huh? Where's the oh, now? Oh, okay. You, you, but not yet, but you are not all capable yet. Where's the now? Okay, but... Huh? The now. Now, 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 oh. now or, does you that go first yet. or last? Well, that's what you have to figure out. Okay. Okay. Okay, but... But now you are not yet all capable. There you go. Okay, so if I look at now... I'm going to be a little bit more formal in translating it, but basically it was that. Which would be the now, the present, the presently would be the now, right? Yeah, the presently would be the now. The yet is what I did is still. Okay. But is but. And the not is still not. Okay, so you did the still as in yet, right? Mm-hmm. Oh, so you did still. Okay. Still there. See, I knew it was right now. It's still going it's, it's from the yet. yet. It's another way you could translate at the. Okay, well, so I heard you say that word I wrote down yet. Well, I put down yet on the thing. Okay. It's one of the ways you can translate at the. It's just in this case, it's a little bit better contextual rendering is still. But if you put something in there that has yet, it's not like it's going to be completely wrong or something like that. Now you are still not all capable. Yeah, the idea is that even at this time, you still, eh, still don't meet the requirements that you should. You're not qualified in the way that you should be. So you're not qualified even yet. You're still not qualified. Yeah, you could phrase it either way. And you'd still have something that would be viable and accurate. Presently, you all are still not capable. Okay, cool. Boy, you aren't just a kid. <laughs>
Yep, yep. That I would say is probably one of the hardest ones. Because when you have a string of adverbs and conjunctions like that, especially in Koine Greek, it's just figure out where this goes. Because Koine Greek does not really organize a lot of their these kinds of words at all. So you just kind of have to know a little bit about how the author talks. Of course, you got to know your context and things like that. And that's why I picked this one is because you look at it and say, like, I'll play around with this a little while. And that's exactly what you have to do. And what do these passages that stick in there? Oh, that is actually a good question. Uh, pretty sure it's from the writings of Paul. Um, I'm not sure. Let me see if I can look that up. Because that does help you to understand the context to know why you said it that way. That's right. All right, see you. Let me see here. Excuse me. I don't know. Not that one. some of the other words that we had in there. But or all after that. We have Uda at the and then noon. Noon. There we go. That should be fairly specific. There we go. First Corinthians three two. I gave you milk not uh, milk to drink, not solid food, because you were not yet ready for it. In fact you were still not ready. Got it from there. Okay. Right, and that is the end of what we got. So we will be able to go through and do the rest of the homework. So now we'll be able to do five through eight, and then fifteen through eighteen. I did use a different format for doing the translations. I hope it's not too confusing, but it did save on space. So hopefully that's not a problem. Hopefully, hopefully. Oh, okay. So they're kind of in little brackets more or less, huh? Yeah, I put the the parsing and lexing information after it's okay. yeah, stacked vertical column. Okay, so I'm just gonna put a little parentheses to keep All right, so any last minute questions or maybe questions about previous lessons or questions in general about Greek? <laughs> I have to preface that. Not, not too general questions, but questions in general about Greek. I admire you, but you can learn it. That's all I got to say. Well, you're learning it. Yeah, well, I'm learning how confusing it is. I'm learning how difficult They say it is. that is the first step. I'm in learning how confusing it is. Yeah. I'm just thinking of AA and groups like that. First, you have to admit that you have a problem. Okay, I have a problem. Oh, honey. And my problem is called Greek. And I'm finding out just how bad it is. That's the next step to getting better. Well, according to AA, but I don't know if I'd use them on everything. Exactly. But seriously, if you guys do have questions, I, I would like to help. And we do have a bit of time. Okay. Are we going to meet next week? Um, would there be a... It's fine. It's just us three. Yeah, I'm okay with it if you're okay with it. I can't think of any particular reason not to. Yeah, because yeah. everything that needs to be done for the fourth celebration will be done before that. Friday and Saturday. Yeah. And then or be yeah, Saturday, Saturday and then Sunday morning. Yeah, so everything should be done. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. yeah, that's fine by me. Okay. So that means that next time we will get started on verbs. Woohoo! Mm -hmm. And then 
if things go according to schedule, which they don't always, but if they do, then the time after that will be ending verbs. And then our final shindig, and we'll be done with this thing. We will have persevered. Now, at the very end, are you going to take all of what you're teaching us and have us, like, dissect some passages and get translations out of them using all of the lessons? I'm kind of debating how I want to do it. Okay. I've been debating between basically doing kind of a basically a set of slides that are quizzes that go over all the things okay. just to review all of it as it was originally presented. Okay. Or, like you said, another thing that we could do is we could do a fairly full translation project that day okay. and just incorporate everything that way. That Actually, to me, that sounds good. I know it's a lot harder, but it sounds good because the practical kind of helps get your brain going, you know? Yeah. It would. Because I keep each lesson in, con in like, I can do this lesson's material, but then trying to add the others really kind of makes put me go. Put it all together. Yeah, I get to put it all together. Makes well, the nice go. thing about the quizzes is that it would actually go through all the lessons yeah. and give you a chance to hit all the main points that way. Yeah, and it would. But it'd be nice to do go through a project to put so them all together. So give her what she wants, and I'll take the lessons. <laughs> okay, <laughs> okay she let him, let her just have it. <laughs> yes. I just want to be able to put all the lessons together and go, oh, I see how it comes now, type of thing. You know, because I'm still very, my boxes are still not, Unpacked. not yeah, not connecting, apparently. <laughs> so that's why you want to do the whole thing? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, I'm not going there. Reviewing <laughs> it would be great. I get that, yeah. but then at the same time, going through and going, okay, now I know why you're doing this and that and what happened. She's crazy. <laughs> well, nobody has ever denied that one. <laughs> Uh, I guess we could do kind of a half and half and okay. meet you halfway. So. so we could do. Um, Basically, a couple questions from each of the lessons, the major lessons, not all the individual ones we did, but from the major sets. And then once we're done with that, we can work on a couple of passages. Maybe, yeah. Yeah, yeah a review of everything. Basically, and, and then, then do a couple passages to kind of get your brain. Cement is shit. Huh? Cement is shit. <laughs> yeah, cement, but ish. Because oh, okay. it's not going to be fine. Cementish. Okay. Cementish. Yes, there we go. <laughs> no, that's not what I said. Cementish. That's how you divide those words up. It's very important right there. Yes. So, yeah, we'll do that. I guess that sounds like a decent plan. And then for passages to translate, um, I, th I know that for sure. If we're going to do that, I would like us to work through the Lord's Prayer. That's a good one to do. Oh, okay. And do you guys have a request for the second one? Something relatively short so we can get done in a timely manner? <laughs> I read <laughs> the 23rd Psalm, but that's um, oh. Hebrew. <laughs> well, there's the, there's the Greek version of it as well. The only problem is you guys don't have access to it because you guys just oh, have yeah, the New that's Testament. True. So let's not do that one then. Yes. Okay, so if Lord's Prayer and... That way we can give you guys a little bit of a heads up so you can start looking at things before we get there. John 11.35, let's do that one. We've already done that one. Oh, have we? And we did it well. Oh, oh. yeah, I think you probably did. Yeah, that was one of the first lessons. In fact, I think that was the first lesson. Yeah. The prologue of John is pretty simple. Sometimes I'll have people go through the first four or five verses. It's usually not too bad. John's relatively simple. Yeah, what do you want? Then? Yeah, yeah, I don't care. Or if we some want something that will really make people's heads spin, we can do Philippians 2. Oh, it'll make our heads spin. Well, it's the uh, the Carmen Christie, so it's a first century poem, basically. Oh, okay. And it's, it doesn't use language in quite standard ways, so it's it's a little hard. Hmm. Well. 
I would not recommend that one. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, we're not doing that one. <laughs> not to start off with. We want to finish in one night, preferably. So yeah, probably not that one. Like I said, the, the prologue of John is usually pretty straightforward and easy. Um, yeah, that's Luke. Luke is not easy. He is not anywhere near easy. <laughs> um, I know it's a little bit boring, but it is relatively straightforward. Is um, the genealogy in Matthew? Uh, genealogy? You know what? That's not. That's not bad. And actually, the genealogy in Luke is really easy, but that would probably be too easy. But yeah. So how is genealogy easy? Excuse it's easy to translate. It's, easy to it's a person's name and somebody begat. Yeah, somebody begat, somebody begat. Oh, Pretty much. So it's really easy to translate. Oh, yeah. so then we, Matthew's is a little bit more involved than, okay. than Luke's. Luke's is really, really, really simple because he just does DRP name, DRP name, DRP name. Yeah. Or we could do a, a couple of verses from the genealogy in Matthew and a couple in Luke just to compare them. Or at least one verse in the book. Because there's some little nuances between the two different gene genealogies. Anyway. There are some major differences there's between the genealogies. Okay, yeah. So. I don't know if we want to dig all of that into one night. Yeah, that's very Yeah. If, if it was my druthers, I would do the Lord's Prayer and <laughs> then the Prologue of John. You know what? You know what we're capable of. <laughs> well, the problem is, you guys don't know all everything you know, that you're what capable we would of. Like to be capable of. <laughs> so I would like to be capable of a lot of things, but it doesn't necessarily yeah. like mean I'm going to be. <laughs> At least not yet. Yes. Yeah. So maybe that's what we'll plan on as Lord's Prayer, and then the first few verses of the Gospel of John. Okay. okay. Sounds good. Doable. Yes. All right, online people, you basically know what your final is going to be. Start studying. <laughs> we'll see how well we do. So we're week seven. So we have week eight, week nine. Mm -hmm. We have week ten, and then the thing. Or week no, week ten, ten is it? Is the is um, the final? We'll be the, the, doing the everything. the final shindig. Okay. Yep. So, okay. Cool. Yeah. So a bit of a review quiz over all of the sections, and then a couple of passages. Okay. Alright, so we've got that down. Anything else that we need to discuss while we got time? How are we supposed to find a verse on for number six? Excuse me. You're not supposed to find the verse. It says find a verse in the interlinear oh. that has a Number six, I am wrong, sorry. Like multiple case based. <laughs> Mm -hmm. I just looked up a preposition and it gave me a verse one to refer to. Yeah. yeah, that one was that one's kind of a long one. You basically thumb through the interlinear through the different verses, find something that has a preposition in it, and look back up in the back and see if it takes on multiple cases. And see if it takes on what? Takes on multiple, multiple cases. cases. Oh, okay. Yeah, that one is a little bit difficult. It's like the ones, you know, look it up in the dictionary, but I don't know how to spell. Well, look it up in the dictionary. You can look it up in the Greek dictionary. Exactly. All kinds of fun. I can't think of anything. All right, so in the online part of it. Now then, see you online people, and we'll work on homework on this side.